Dear students, real estate is a world unto itself, an entire universe. And we are not going to do it justice, my apologies. But we hope to whet your appetite for those of you who have the desire to investigate the world of real estate because it can be very profitable. But I like to say that real estate is tricky, which is a, a euphemism for real estate is a royal pain in the... Uh, do you remember the PETA factor for mutual funds? The pain in the fa factor? Yes. Well, it's very low with mutual funds, right? Once you've chosen the mutual fund. But with real estate? Uh-uh. <laughs> You're going to earn every penny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So let's get started. There are two types of real estate investments. Direct real estate investments, which we'll spend most of our time on, and then indirect real estate investments. But first, let's take a look at direct real estate investor investments. And as the investor, you hold title to the property. Your home uh, or a vacation home have investment qualities, but their homes first, investment second, in my humble opinion. Now, rental property is what we normally discuss when we're discussing real estate investments. And as I said, that's a whole world, a whole course unto itself. The problem with real estate is it's very difficult to teach from a book or a class. It's kind of like trying to teach somebody to drive without getting behind the wheel of the car or learning how to swim without jumping in the pool. With stocks, we can simulate. We can do a lot of the research and actually create a sample portfolio and track it over time and Real estate, no. A lot of the things that you're going to need to learn, you have to learn as you're doing them. And some of them can be quite shocking, which is why we are going to, not for the last time, suggest that if you are in, interested in real estate, that you get a job in the industry as a property manager or an appraiser or in a real estate office, a title insurance company, an escrow company and learn the maze of, <laughs> of uh, things that you have to deal with from the inside out. Now, people will tell you that the most tremendous gains, gains come from undeveloped land. And they're correct, but it imposes enormous risks. It is not for the neophyte. Don't make land your first investment. All your money is riding on that single parcel, parcel of land. There's no cash flow, no rent. You still have to pay the property taxes. And depending on your jurisdiction and the economics of your location, there's no guarantee you'll be able to develop the land. So don't invest in dirt. Now, maybe someday down the line, once you've become a seasoned real estate investor, you might want to tackle a, an undeveloped land project and develop it and become fabulously wealthy and uh, hopefully don't have uh, ulcers developed. <laughs> but don't do it yet. Okay, okay. Now, the next group, as we said, are the indirect real estate investments. And some of these... In most notably the real estate investment trusts that we'll discuss in detail later on, are something you're actually fairly familiar with because they look like stocks. Yeah, real estate investment trusts. They're not corporations. They're not stocks, but they trade like stocks. They function like stocks. And so these are things that we have already discussed and understand uh, how to value and the like. There are other indirect real estate investments, such as syndicates and limited partnerships. And again, not for the neophyte, unless you have a trusted advisor who's going to uh, um, 
help you along the way. For those who are, um, who are very high up in the income brackets and the high net worth, they might be interested in tax credits, which can turn out to be actually very profitable down the line but give you a tax break now. A topic that we discuss in Business 121 Financial Planning and Money Management when we, when we discuss housing is equity sharing, which is actually a pretty interesting uh, uh, investment alternative. It is often done within a family, but doesn't have to be. The young couple or the young individual wants to buy a home, but doesn't have the down payment. They have good credit, decent salary, and the desire to own, but they don't have the down payment. So sometimes the parents or the grandparents have the money to invest. They, the grandparents or, grand, or parents, will um, put up the, uh, the down payment. And then all individuals will be on the, the title and the loan, the mortgage, <laughs> most importantly. And the younger couple or the young individual will make the payments and live in the home. And then all share in the appreciation. That's why it's called equity sharing. Don't do it without talking to a competent lawyer, attorney, a real estate attorney, who will um, either draw up the documents or have somebody else do it. Okay? And as we said, it doesn't have to be a familial relationship. It could be a, um, a business relationship with an individual who wants to invest and a couple or an individual who wants to buy a home. But again, competent legal advice for the documentation so that there's no <laughs> surprises down the line. Now here is something that I've often just poo-pooed. First and second mortgages, first and second trustees, you play the part of the bank or the credit union because there are some people who just can't get a loan for whatever reason. The project's too risky or their credit is too horrible and they come to you. There's a name for this. It's called hard money. You are not the owner, you're the loaner. And the interest rates are eye-popping. 9, 10, 11% when mortgages right now are three and a half. <laughs> so I was always thought, okay, forget it. You know, you're going to get burned and it's going to be horrible to try to get the person out of the place. You have to foreclose and then who knows if it's destroyed or not. But then a friend of mine asked me to come to a presentation from a local company here in San Diego, Federal Home Loan Corporate... No, it sounds like Fannie Mae. It's, it's, the, <laughs> the name is close to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But it's a, it's a local co company. They've been in business for many decades now. And I was quite impressed with the presentation. And my, after there was time for questions, and my first question was, okay, what's your default rate? And she looked at me and she goes, well, we've got about 200 loans currently. And two are in foreclosure, but... There's another two that are distressed, but we think they're going to come through. They've come through in the past. And I'm 2% in trouble, 1% in foreclosure. Whoa, any bank or credit union would be very happy with those statistics. So obviously there are exceptions, right? But you can get obviously burnt. Your, your name's on the title. They're, they can't sell it without you your approval, but at the same time, to have to foreclose is an unpleasant and maybe unrewarding experience. Or who knows, you might actually wind up with a piece of property that's worth a whole lot more than what you came up, what you brought to the table as the, uh, as the mortgage lender. Now, we're gonna turn our attention to investing in rental property. Many investors will start with a residential property such as a condo, uh, I'm sorry, Investing in rental property, right. Many investors will start with residential properties, a condo, a house, a duplex, maybe live in one and rent out the other. Commercial property is where the big money is. Hotels, office buildings, stores, and other types of commercial establishments. Here in San Diego, <laughs> 
forget it. Forget it. Don't be surprised in either case if you're looking at negative cash flow for several years. What does that mean? The money coming in from the rent does not pay the mortgage, the insurance, the taxes, the maintenance, the utilities. The rule of thumb is that the price should be roughly equal to seven times annual rent. Ha <laughs> ha! No, before the 2008-2009 turmoil, for over 20 years, since the 1980s, uh, prices had been nowhere near this 7 to 10 rule. The 2008-2009 turmoil changed the investing landscape for several years, and you could find properties that satisfied this 7 to 10 times annual rent. So say the, the rent was 30000 you could find a place for 300000 You could, not anymore. Prices are untouchable again for most investors who aren't willing to deal with negative, um, negative um, um, cash flow. If you are so inclined, though, I think the South Bay is where the bargains are. That's my two cents for what it's worth. What about fixer-uppers? Mm, again, San Diego, you're up against the best in real estate investors in the world. So it's not likely that you're gonna find a fixer-upper that's, that's a good price that you can afford and work on, unless it really is more than just a fixer-upper and it's a teardown and you have to start all over again. And even then you're gonna have a hard time going up against some of these uh, people with who have tremendous experience and a whole lot of resources. But if you are so inclined, or maybe you're not in San Diego, concentrate on smaller fixer-uppers first, maybe two to four units, a triplex, a duplex, a quadplex, live in one of them. That way you know if there's parties going on at 2 a.m. in the morning. Look for low down payments and seller financing of rundown properties. Banks usually do not want a loan to distress properties. So you go to the seller, they want to sell, they've basically let the place fall into disrepair, and you say, hey, you've been getting rent from this property for quite some time. How would you like to now get a mortgage payment every uh, uh, month? Not, not having to pay it, we pay you the mortgage payment because nobody's buying your property. Uh, again, San Diego, somebody's going to buy it. But in another area, they might say, yeah, sure, 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 no problem. Banks are normally all too happy <laughs> to finance a rundown disclosure on their books because the bank doesn't want the real estate. In the great turmoil of 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 even, the banks had so many foreclosures on the books they just didn't even know what to do. We, we put an offer in, I forget, late 2009. It was like September, early September. And the bank said, well, we'll get back to you in December. I said, no, thanks. <laughs> no, we're not waiting that long for you to tell us no. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Avoid property managers. Now, folks, there are always exceptions. But nobody cares about your property as much as you do. Find a cadre of qualified people that you can trust, plumber, electrician, uh, handyman, contractor, uh, yeah, and, and treat them well. Because <laughs> the property manager is going to basically do the same thing, and uh, it's not their property, and they take 10% of the rent. So, again, there are exceptions always, but I think it's better for you to be your own property manager. Most importantly, are you either of, whether it's a fixer upper or not, are you savvy dealing with repairs and are you savvy dealing with renters? Because fixing a tenant is just as important as fixing a toilet and a whole lot harder. One bad tenant can send you back thousands of dollars. And landlords will uh, uh, trade horror stories of what some tenants had done. And I thought I had, had, had a couple of good ones until one of the students in one of the classes told me about their uh, parents, tenants from hell. They had two renters, two gentlemen, 
uh, roommates in a house in Texas. The one roommate killed the other roommate and then set fire to the house in an attempt to cover up the murder. Well, when you when a house is on fire, there's a fire department that comes and puts out the fire and they find a dead body in the place. And the guy didn't understand that house fires get to be about 1,000 degrees. To really burn a body, you need 1,800 degrees. And, and I'm sure that gentleman is still in jail for what he had done. Yeah, that one takes the cake. Make improvements that add perceived value. Now, I am... When it comes to fixing things, and I'm, that's why we have the telephone. That's how I fix things. You call people. But I love this guy's book. He, writes, he wrote a few, but I only read, only read this one. I need to read more of them. Investing in fixer-uppers. J.P. De, J. Sima. Install a white picket fence. Yeah, that's what people love. I don't know why, but they love a white picket fence. And he took one house that was settling. This is typical houses settle the foundation. Not usually at the end of the world, but it makes the house look tilted. So when he replaced the windows and the doors, what did he do? He tilted them in the opposite direction so that now the house doesn't look like it's leaning. It's nothing new. That's what the Italian engineers did with the leaning tower of pizza. If you, pizza. If you look at it carefully, at the top, they tried move, they tried tilting the top, and it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, check it out. And what are some of the advantages of real estate? Well, there are, there are a few. There's a, um, a, a the phenomenon of hedge against inflation. When inflation becomes a problem, typically real estate will uh, guard against that. It will go up with inflation. Not always, but that's what's happened typically in the past. Financial leverage, there's that word again, leverage. The use of borrowed funds for investment purposes, which allows you to acquire a more expensive property than you could on your own. And we will take a look at this in detail later on. For the real estate partnerships, the REITs, the, re the real estate investment trusts, easy entry, sometimes easy exit. REITs are very easily liquidated and no management concerns. And one of the cool things about real estate used to be that you couldn't check the price of your real estate investments every day on the internet, which is one of the major problems for many people when they invest in stocks. They say they're in it for the long term, but every 15 minutes they're checking their phone or their computer to see what happened to their, oh my goodness, it went up 25 cents, which, it went down 50 cents, what should I do? Well, actually, unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, you can check the price of your real estate every day on the internet with websites like Zillow and Trulia. And there are individuals who are hooked on that, unfortunately, because in my humble opinion, their, their, their estimates are usually, they're, they're close, but they're not reliable by any stretch of the imagination. They will tell you the same because real estate, are, real estate transactions are not like stock transactions. You know, millions of transactions every day in stocks, but not millions in real estate. What are the disadvantages? Well, real estate is the poster child for poor liquidity, which means it may be hard to sell your property or your share of the property if it's a partnership. This is not a problem with real estate investment trusts, which look, which look like stocks and we'll discuss later on. It usually takes three, six, nine months to sell a house. Now, sometimes, most notably in San Diego, you put the for sale sign up on Thursday, and by Saturday, you've already got five or ten offers, and Sunday you write the sales agreement, the sales contract. But that's not, that's the exception. That's here in Southern California, not the rule around the world. And when you buy a single piece of property, well, you've got a lack of diversification. Again, partnerships, real estate investment trusts, no, but... When you're the landlord, yeah, lack of diversification. Uh, if you invest in syndicates, again, you need a trusted advisor because there are tax consequences. And then the PETA factor that we talked about, the management and tenant problems. And yes, dear students, although it doesn't look like it at the time, 10, 12 years ago, 
property values can and do decline from time to time. Your home, slide number nine, as an investment. Well, for many people, their home is a major asset. And, as we said, a hedge against inflation. So when people are talking about different investments, and I recommend stocks for most individuals starting out, and they say, what about real estate? Well, real estate is tricky. Fancy way of saying it's a pain in the neck. And if you own a home, you already own some real estate, right? So you're diversified uh, against, uh, not to say against, but you have some real estate, you have some stocks and maybe some bonds and the like. And there are tax advantages if the house is your principal residence. $250,000 capital gains tax-free for single people, double it for married folks. Buy your house for two hundred dollars or 300000 sell it for seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 if you're married, new capital gains. But in my humble opinion, you shouldn't really think of your home as an investment. That's me. Other people are going to disagree. I mean, it's a home first, an investment second. Some will say, oh, no, 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 you're going to buy your home over here in this area, which is appreciating very quickly. And then in a few years, you're going to sell that house and then move over here, which is going to be even faster appreciation. They're usually real estate agents because every time you buy and sell, they make a transaction. For me, it's a home first and investment second. When you discuss investments with individuals, and specifically if you get on the topic of real estate, you often hear them say, ah, yeah, but my house is the best investment I've ever made. And then if you question them a little further about, well, what other investments have, well, it's pretty much the only investment I've ever made. Yeah, except for that penny stock, my brother-in-law, the ex-stockbroker, conned me into buying, but that stuff is worthless now. And those gold coins I bought way back when the first Gulf War started, back in 90, what, 1991. What did I do with those things anyway? Look, <laughs> the bottom line is a house is a home first and investment second. But what about San Diego? Ha, 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 ha. Well, you know, it's an unusual location. Uh, the West Coast and parts of the East Coast and Chicago and the Northeast. Northwest. Prices in San Diego have gone down in the past. They will go down sometime in the future, even though today they're skyrocketing. But if you plan on staying here, by all means, buy whatever you can afford. It's not as though San Diego is becoming less desirable to live in. And if you don't believe me, you folks who grew up there, here, go to Buffalo for a winter, okay? And some people love the weather. They love the frigid north. I'm not one of them. The South Bay, again, is the is the place where the best deals are, in my humble opinion. San Isidro, National City. Oh my god, you live in National City. It's actually quite nice, you know. It's a little rough around the edges, but the streets are wide. The houses typically have a lot of room. And check the prices lately. It is not a secret that California has a housing supply and demand imbalance, and there are a lot of cultural issues that are keeping us back. But in 2021, our legislator did so legislature did something that I could have knocked me over with a feather, and I'm not sure. I think people are still stunned, and they're not sure exactly how it's going to play out. But they have made it so that any single family home can be turned into four units. I, I'm not an expert, and I'm probably making it too simplistic, but that's going to just change the face of California. And at the same time, create, I hope, personally, I'm one of the Yimbies, yes, in my backyard, create a whole lot more housing. Now, it's going to create another problem, and that's transportation, and hopefully we're going to get our arms around that also. Um, yay for driverless cars that will come and pick you up and two or three other people at the same time if you're willing to pay a little bit less if you're willing to pay more then of course you get your own car so we'll see we'll see what happens the future <laughs> if we knew it was going to happen they wouldn't call it the future did you would they but still 
Still, it is uh, promising, in my humble opinion, where other people are very upset. They don't want change. Okay. We'll have more and more people living on the streets. Is, the, is, that, is that good for you? You like that? With hepatitis? Yeah, okay. And this is a sign that I saw a long time ago. Well, no, wait, a long time. Third and was 30 years ago. Circa 1993. And I just laughed and laughed. This was up in North County. Please, God, let there be another real estate boom, and I promise I won't piss it all away this time. You think she did in 2007, 2006 and 7? Because there was a real estate boom in the 1980s, starting in the late 1970s, and then uh, uh, continuing through the 80s, and then it busted in 1990, 91, 92. Quiet for a while, and then starting in 1999, 2000, it, it, it became hyperkinetic until 2008 when it blew up or blew down, blew, imploded again. And now we're in the middle of another boom. How long it's going to last? I don't know. But again, don't piss it all away. Do you think she did? I think she probably did. Hang on a second. The next line there. Slide 13. Come on, Piano. Admit it. Real estate is the perfect investment. Look at what's happened over the past five years. This is what people were telling me. Because I was saying, you know, I think all the money has already been made. 2005 and 6, and my buddy and I were saying, you know, this is a bubble. It's not going to end well. Now, he was far more pessimistic than I was. I thought prices would go down about 20 25%, as they did in 91, 92. No, 50, 60, 70% in some places. Look, this is nothing new, folks. Beware the permanent trend, Mr. Tobias. Real estate goes up and down in cycles. Ask those who bought in 90 and sold in 94. And ask those who bought that flipper condo in 2006 and lost everything when they went through bankruptcy or a short sale or just walked away from the property. But if you plan to hold for the long term, you should do well. Again, it's not as if San Diego is becoming less desirable. By the way, I hope by now, you understand that there is no perfect investment. All investments have advantages. All investments have disadvantages. The key is to have our eyes wide open and balance the risk versus the reward. You know, the perfect investment, that's was, those were internet stocks back in the late 1990s. And now they're saying the same things about cryptocurrencies and NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> perfect investment until they aren't until the dead bodies are all over the floor but what about leverage huh what about the ability to make money with other people's money well we've already discussed leverage haven't we with buying on margin and options and futures but isn't that what makes real estate such a great investment well yes it is but there are pitfalls just as with buying on stock on margin and buying, just as with buying stock on margin, excuse me, leveraging real estate can magnify your gains <laughs> and magnify your losses. And there's a worksheet that we're going to work on together that we would pass out in the face to face class. You can print it out or just follow along because here it is. These are questions, these two questions were from one of our financial planning books about 2004 or so, as the real estate market was jumping 20% a year. And see, even textbook authors can get caught up in the mania. The first question was calculating the return on investment. Dave, uh, good old Dave, he bought a rental property for $200,000 cash. Now, most people don't do that, right? One year later, he sold it for $240,000. What was the return on his $200,000 investment? Well, we've done this, right? Haven't we? You take the selling price and, and subtract the initial price. What he brought to the table is what you'll hear people say. And that's $40,000 of absolute return. You take the $40,000 absolute return divided by the $200,000 
initial investment, what he brought to the table, and you get 0.2 or 20% return on investment. And this is what was happening with real estate. It was going up 20% a year. It cost Dave 200,000 to make 40,000. But now the second question was calculating the return on investment using financial leverage. Suppose Dave invested only $20,000 of his own money and borrowed 180,000. 90% financing. What was his return on investment? Well, again, the house went up 20% to 240,000. So a $40,000 absolute dollar return. But this time the initial investment is only 20,000. So you take $40,000 absolute return divided by the $20,000 of what Dave brought to the table and you get 2.0, 200%. It only cost Dave $20,000 to make $40,000. You see why people get caught up in the mania? Look at that idiot down the street. He just made 200% on his money in a year. Me some too. <laughs> so you run down to the condo store the thing isn't even built yet. You put thirty or forty thousand dollars down, and nine months later, when it's ready to be moved in, you sell it. You don't even have to move, and you've made forty, fifty thousand dollars. This is what was going on in the mid two thousands, and it's great while the music is playing, until the music stops and everybody fall down. By the way you need 25% now. Most all lenders will not allow you to buy a rental property unless you can put up at least 20 25%. So you see Dave would have had to come up with $50,000, right? 25% would that be right? Yeah, 25% would be 50,000. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Now, <coughs> slide 16. Calculating the return on investment using financial leverage and things don't go as planned. This was the book, this was the problem that the author of the financial planning textbook conveniently left out. Suppose Dave invested only 20,000 of his own money and borrowed 180,000, that's 90% financing, and the property value went down 20%. Now the question is, what is he going to tell his wife? <laughs> because the property has dropped in value $40,000 to $160,000. Now he cannot sell the property for more than $160,000. But he still owes $180,000. The bank is not going to let him sell the property for $160,000 unless he comes up with an extra $20,000. He is underwater. He has negative equity. And what he tells his wife is, honey, <laughs> we have a problem. And what does he do? Well, if he's lucky enough or fortunate enough to be able to weather the storm, he holds on. He um, you know, collects the rent, uh, continues making the mortgage payments, and he weathers the storm and comes out on the other side okay, hopefully. But if he had gotten one of those optional adjustable rate mortgages where his payments started a whole lot less than they should have, and he could afford those, but then in two, years two and three, they go up substantially. And in the fourth year, they reset, whatever that means. And now he's got to make the full payment and he can't do it. Now he's in trouble. What does he do? Well... <laughs> What did a lot of people do? They went through foreclosure. They went through bankruptcy. They organized what's called a short sale. They went to the bank and said, oops, I goofed. I can't make the payments. And this guy over here will pay me $160,000 for the house. Will you allow me to sell it for $160,000? And the bank, which has in 2009, 10, 11, and 12, Thousands of these things on their books says, all right, okay. 
So they forgive the $20,000 extra amount that he cannot come up with. Now, during normal times, <laughs> that $20,000 that was forgiven, Dave would have to claim that on his taxes and pay income tax on that $20,000. The IRS rules that a forgiven loan is taxable interest. Talk about adding insult to injury, pouring salt into the wound, kicking a person when they're down. Now, the uh, Congress saw what was happening, and they, uh, until 2013, they waived that requirement. They said to the IRS, hey, don't do that. Don't hit people with a tax bill on money that they borrowed and weren't able to repay. Yeah. So you see, leverage increases your possibilities for gains and increases, magnifies your losses. Because, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to press that button. Um, in uh, 2009, 8, 9, people were asking me, oh, how do you feel about losing, you know, how much? I said, well, you know, we're down about 40%. And I don't feel great. <laughs> it feels like somebody kicked you in the gut. But I really feel for the property owners, for the real estate investors who've lost everything and still owe tens of thousands of dollars. Now, we used a, a $200,000 house that was you know, multiplied by two or three times for people in San Diego who bought the house for $500,000 and then a few years later they could barely sell it for two twenty-five dollars or two fifty, dollars And now you understand why the banks were bailed out because they were left with you know, people just walking away or just going through foreclosure or organizing short sales, and they lost you know, billions of dollars. And uh, I take Mr. Ben Bernanke at his word. I held my nose and I wrote the check. Because we don't want the nation's banking system to fail, do we? Some people did. They don't realize what a nuclear device they're they're playing with. They didn't, they didn't understand that we would have gone through the Great Depression again, and some people were ready to accept that. I don't think they understood what they were playing with. And we averted another Great Depression. We had the Great Recession. And the problem, some people say, well, we should have done it. We would have gotten, come out better. You know, the problem with the $20 trillion economy is you don't have two of them. <laughs> you can't have a control group and then a test group. It doesn't work that way. They don't call economics the dismal science for nothing. So let's continue. Slide number 17. Wait a minute, Piano. Did you say there are no capital gains taxes on real estate? Yeah. Currently, as the law stands now, as long as the real estate is your primary residence for two out of the last five years, you could rent it for 20 years, live in it for two years, and now it's your primary residence. You pay no capital gains tax on the two First, $250,000 if you're single, $500,000 if you're married. Sweet deal. And for those who are good at fixer-uppers, well, you know, move into a place that's run down. Over the next two years, you usually have an extra job, right? Uh, work on the place, get it fixed up, sell it, no capital gains. Very cool. On the flip side, capital losses on your primary residence are not tax deductible. Now, be careful. Uh, the IRS is kind of tricky on this. They have a series of questions they ask to see if it's your principal residence. And there was a very famous case of a couple who were you know, fairly wealthy. They had a house in Wisconsin, one in Arizona, and one in Florida. And they lived in all three and moved from place to place. And when they sold one, they said, that's our primary residence. And the IRS said, IRS said no, you have no primary residence. You, you don't really live in any one of the places. And one in court. <laughs> so there's a whole list of questions. Do you have your, where do you vote? Where do you work? Where's your driver's license and the like? And so, um, yeah, be careful if you're the kind of person who likes to uh, buy a bunch of places and say, this is my, this is my principal residence. This is my principal residence. Yeah. Slide number 18. Speaking of info, were we talking about infomercials? Have you seen the ad? Start your real estate empire with no money down. You too can take advantage of the tremendous opportunities now in the wide open real estate foreclosure market or whatever. Just buy our guaranteed surefire real estate investment kits. 
you will be on your way toward riches beyond your wildest dreams. I will sell you a five-day seminar for only $9,995. This is perfectly guaranteed. Don't worry about burning that credit card because you're going to pay that credit card and all the other credit cards off in two or three months. And when that doesn't work, we'll sell you the $25,000 ultra-exclusive two-week Hawaiian seminar, which is, allows you to... to yeah. I think I could make a lot of money if I, had in, if I didn't have FX. On the website is a link to an article from Yahoo Finance where one of these flipping people on the reality, I can't stand they call it reality television. It is such, it's such, such an oxymoron. It wants to sell you a seminar for only $34,000 to teach you to flip houses. Okay, fine. If it sounds too good to be true. Slide number 19. So my advice on rental real estate is to buy a house, make it your home. After you've digested that purchase, see, see, a house is really cool as an investment. It's a home first, but you can't live in a mutual fund. You can't live in a stock. You can live in your home. After you've digested that purchase, then go look for some rental property, but learn as much as you can from folks who are already doing it. Maybe even, as I said, working for a property manager, an escrow company, a title insurance company, a real estate brokerage, a real estate agency. Uh, become an appraiser if you want to work 24 hours a day, make tons of money and have no life. But let's say you don't want to be a landlord. Let's say you don't want all the headaches involved because, dear students, you're going to earn every penny. Trust me. You don't want all the headaches that come with owning re rent real estate investment properties. No problem. For you, we have indirect investments and the one that makes the most sense for the vast majority of us are real estate investment trusts as we said they look like stocks they look like they trade like a stock they pay they don't really pay dividends they they pay dividends but they're not stock dividends so that means they're taxed at a higher rate but they look like dividends as far as we're concerned they must distribute, I think it's 90%. I gotta fix that. I, I, thought, I thought it was 95, then I, then I saw something that said 90%. So I have to fix that. They, unlike a stock, right? See, a stock is a corporation. A real estate investment trust is a trust. And that's why we have lawyers to tell us the difference between the two. But the real estate investment trust must pay out 90% of their earnings every year. Unlike a stock, a stock doesn't have to pay any dividends. They could just say, hey, you know, we made a lot of money, but we're gonna hang on to it we want to use it to uh, um, make the, expand the business. Or they could pay out 50% or whatever. No, the rate REIT must pay out 90% of their earnings. Uh, so, so who are these people anyway? What are they? Well, they're kind of, you can think of them like a mutual fund that invests in real estate. Uh, Target, Walmart, Home Depot, they don't typically own that real estate. No, they go into 30, 40 year leases. And who actually owns the real estate? Typically real estate investment trusts, apartment complexes, office buildings, warehouses. Yeah, they're pretty interesting. Um, and we have one, a long lived um, uh, real estate uh, investment trust here in San Diego called Realty Income. The symbol is O, O, O. But I think they might have merged or are merging with some other company. And the management fees typically range between 1% and 2%, kind of like a mutual fund. And the long-term returns have been, you know, 7 to 8%, which is pretty darn good. Some have done better, some have done worse. Uh, right now, they're not paying as much as they usually do. That's because everybody's just reaching for yield. But typically, 5 6 7% or more is, uh, is what you can get from real estate investment trusts. And some of them are paying, you know, pretty good dividend yields. Um, so... Check them out if you're so inclined. They're not as exciting as some growth stocks. They're kind of like boring ra real estate, I mean, sorry, um, railroad companies or food companies. Right, 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 right. And you're a real estate investor with not having to fix toilets, not having to fix tenants, 
<laughs> None of the landlord concerns that a real estate rental investor has to deal with. So that is our discussion of real estate and real estate investment trusts. Again, I tell you that the best way to learn about real estate, in my humble opinion, is to get involved in the industry. Because if you don't, you're going to learn. Oh, yes, you're going to learn. But sometimes <laughs> it's going to be an unpleasant learning experience. But I will tell you that um, luckily for us, my wife and I, uh, our real estate projects have all basically turned out pretty good for us. So thank you very much, real estate world. And um, we're ready now to take a look at brokerages, account types, and annuities. So brokerages and account types are some of the logistics that we have to work, worry about. Annuities are something, again, that we teach you about, so you'll know to stay far away from them. Dear students, never trust an insurance company with your investments. And I'm an insurance agent also, so... I'll tell you the truth. See you in our next presentation when we discuss brokerage firms, account types, and annuities.